communication. We pray all this in the precious name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Well, I am excited to be with you evening, this evening to, uh, to go through uh, an exciting, um, I'm going to call it a transformation. Um, I want to start off by just talking about um, something that I've learned through my, uh, through my years at work. You know, I've got a few gray hairs now, and I've got a, few, a couple decades of uh, work experience behind me, and I've had a, a lot of bosses, good, bad. Um, luckily more good than bad but one of the things that I've noticed uh, through the years uh, that uh, one of the traits on the good or better bosses is the, the fact that they could ask really good questions they were really good at asking questions in fact I had one recently and he would say this all the time it's not the answers that you get it's the questions that you ask it's not the answers that you get it's the questions that you ask and what I see, what I've seen with the, the folks that have been able to do that is they learn and they very seldom ever take the first explanation or the first answer. They always want more. Why? Help me understand. Please explain. Because the right questions, they can help us grow. They can help us learn. They help us to, they force us to dig deeper. And we see that in the Bible with the Bereans, right? I was having a conversation with Brandon Williamson about this a couple weeks ago. It made me really think. We were talking about and he fa in fact, he, he brought it up. He said, we should all be really good question askers. And we should be asking questions about everything that we do. We should all be Bereans that way. And I really thought about it. I said, well, maybe the, the Bereans probably were really good at asking a lot of questions that way. So I've got a question. The overarching question tonight is, can people change? And if so, how can they do it? We're going to look at Paul. We're going to look at Paul's life and sort of go through this. So first, before we do that, let's think about from a it, it, people changing and, and, and all that stuff. Let's think about it from a worldly perspective. The world's view would tell us that we can change ourselves through personal growth and development and hard work and determination if we want it bad enough. If we want it bad enough, if we have the right attitude, if we have the right mindset, if we set good enough goals, if we're... If we're uh, passionate enough to make the change, if we're committed enough to make it happen, then we can do it, right? And all these things, they aren't bad, but they don't produce transformational change. They never change the fundamentals of who we are at the core. So, who are, and if, once again, you'll see these questions here as, as we peel the onion back. Who are we and what are we at the core? Jonathan Edwards in 1753 had a, uh, a sermon called Natural Man in a Dreadful Condition. And he had a quote from this sermon, Sin is a thing of a dreadful nature, and that because it is against an infinitely great and infinitely holy God, there is in the nature of man enmity against God, contempt of God, rebellion against God. And that's us when we're left on our own to try and do better. That's, uh, that's us on left on our own to be better. On our own, people can become more disciplined. We can do that. We can become more disciplined. We can have better habits. We can have better routines. We can, ha we can work on having a better positive attitude. But on our own, we can never change our nature. We can, people can never change their own nature. However, the good news is God is able to change who we are at the core. God is able to transform us. Now, most of us remember the name Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer was uh, called the cannibal of Milwaukee, and he had horrific crimes uh, several years ago over the course of many years, and I won't get into them, but he was... Uh, convicted of uh, horrible, horrible things. And this is how he described himself. This is Jeffrey Dahmer describing himself. He says, it's hard for me to believe that a human being could have done what I've done, but I know what I did. I know that I did it. So Jeffrey Dahmer 
I, I didn't know. I don't know much about Jeffrey Dahmer other than than uh, than what I'm going to share with you tonight. There was a gentleman by the name of Kurt Booth who had a prison ministry in the area where Jeffrey Dahmer was serving his prison. So he got to know Jeffrey Dahmer through that prison ministry and shared the gospel with him. And Jeffrey Dahmer became a Christian. They became brothers in Christ before, uh, as, he was, as he was serving his time. And at some point in, in this time, Jeffrey, uh, an attempt was made on, on Jeffrey Dahmer's life while he was in prison. And he wrote a letter to Kurt and this is what it said. He says, I don't know if you heard, but last Sunday I was attacked while in the chapel. Some guy tried to cut my throat open with a razor, but didn't succeed. The razor broke and my neck was only slightly scratched. I believe that it was only the protective grace of our great Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that saved me from serious injury or death. A future attempt on his life was successful. So he was killed in prison. And Kurt wrote this, that the man that brought him to faith said, I know Jeffrey was ready. Today all the angels in heaven are rejoicing because Jeffrey, Jeffrey has come home. On the great resurrection day, I'm expecting to see him right along, with, right along there with Abraham, David, Isaac, James, John, and all the saints that have re lived right up to the modern day. See, we're quick to identify or label people that we think are too evil to be saved, that are past that point that can't be saved. But God chooses who to save, and God chooses who to use for his purposes. Don't forget that some of the heroes of the faith, right? Our, our heroes of the faith included murderers like Moses and David. So God can and does transform, not superficially, not temporarily, but permanently and completely. So tonight we're going to look at another unlikely person that God chose to transform and use for his glory, and that was Saul of Tarsus. And I want to look th at three things in, Paul, excuse me, in Saul's transformation to Paul. I want to look at Saul the before, the transformation event itself, and then Paul the transformed. Now, if you're watching this, and, you, and you, you may get confused with the Saul, there's two main Sauls in the Bible. One is Saul, the first king of Israel. That's not who we're talking about tonight. This is Saul, who's going later going to become Paul. And Pastor Cal referenced, he wrote most of the New Testament. That's the Saul we're talking about tonight. So we're going to be in, and I know that was a long introduction, but we're going to be in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 20. So if I can get you to stand up with me, we'll read this. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 20. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what to do. The men who are traveling with him, they stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground. Although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was out without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in the vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hand on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard many things about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from ch the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. Laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road 
by which you came has set me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight and he rose and was baptized. Taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the son of God. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that your greatness would be magnified tonight, that your grace, mercy, sovereignty would all be highlighted as we go through this account, Lord. I would pray that you would use this message tonight to glorify yourself. In Christ's name, amen. Please have a seat. So, so we see this event, and I know it's, it's a lot of verses. You're saying, oh my gosh, we're going to be here all night. I'm going to break it down into three different parts. I want to look at Saul the before, verses 1 and 2. So Saul, still breathing sets, excuse me, threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the, synagogue, uh, to the synagogues at Damascus. So if they found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to, to Jerusalem. So who was Saul? This is his background. He was from Tarsus, which is modern-day Turkey. He was born to Jewish parents, so that made him a Jew. And he was a Roman citizen. Which gave that title came with very, very important rights. And if you know the account, you understand that he was able to appeal to Caesar later in his life and, and, and how that worked. So he was from Tarsus, he was from modern day Turkey, he was a Jew, and he was a Roman citizen. And he was highly trained, he was highly, highly educated. He studied the law under a famous rabbi in Gamaliel. So, what did he, had he been doing? He had been persecuting Jews. He was present. We know that he was present when Stephen was stoned in Acts chapter 7. And he was sending Christians to prison, both men and women. Saul was passionate. And Saul was committed. He was a passionate and committed enemy of God. Just like we were before we were saved. We see his passion and commitment through his actions. Just like others can see our passion and commitment through our actions. The question we have to ask is, do our actions reflect those that are passionately committed to serving Jesus? Or somebody else? So, how does Paul describe himself? What, how does he describe the before? He does it. In, chapter, in Acts chapter 26, he does it. Verses 4 and 5 says, My manner of life from my youth spent... From the beginning, among my own nation and in, in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they're willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. Later on in verses 9 and 11, 9 through 11, he says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in, op in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in the synagogues, and I tried to make them blaspheme. And in a raging fury against them, I persecuted even them to foreign cities. So Paul describes himself, his old self, as strictly, strictly religious and in a raging fury against God's people. That's how he describes himself. So that was, that was Saul in a nutshell. He was highly educated, he was respected in society, and he had a deep commitment to persecute Christians. But thankfully, that's not the end of the story. Those same attributes, his education, his status, his determination, his commitment, would all be used for a different purpose it would end up making him a powerful tool for God. Before we were saved, we were enemies of God because we were committed to most likely serving ourselves. You, know, you think about Paul writing that letter and describing himself as Saul, his old self, the unsaved self. And I think it's healthy for us to look back and think of ourselves, our old selves our unsaved selves. And I'll tell you right now, I think that's painful for me to look back and, and the shame and the, and the pitiful state 
that existed. But I tell you, it's healthy because it reminds us of what Jesus pulled us from, what we've been saved from. It reminds us of what Christ did for us. So that's the before. That's Saul before he was Paul. Let's look now at the actual transformation event, verses 3 through 9. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, who you're persecuting. But rise, enter the city, you'll be told what to do. And the men were, that were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, neither ate nor drank. So what do we see here? Saul's heading to Damascus. And he's got, basically, he's got arrest warrants in his pocket. He's got exactly what he wants. He's got arrest warrants with names on them, and he's heading right to go get them. And all of a sudden, there's this light from heaven. And I'll tell you, until I really got into this, I passed over this light from heaven. So I was headed to the ground before the voice hit. It was the light that got him. He suddenly a light from heaven shone around him and he fell to the ground. It wasn't the voice that got him to the ground. It was the light that got him to the ground. You got to think about this. We know that this event happened around noon. Acts chapter 22 verse 6 tells us that. And what do we know about the Middle East at noon? It's hot and sunny. Right? There's bright light everywhere in the middle of the day in the Middle East. So this light that came down must have been like a nuclear blast on steroids. I mean, it must have been immense. And it was because it was the appearance of Jesus in glory. It was, it was, it was a light like nobody else had ever seen in the history of man. So Paul later clarified that the entire group saw the light. They saw the light, but he was the only one that could understand the verbal message. He was the only one that could actually understand what was being said. But we have to recognize here that the, just the presence of the Lord had Saul on his knees. The presence of the Lord had Saul on his knees. Jesus comes to Saul in just a spectacular way here. He identifies himself to Saul, and then he asks Saul a question. He says, why are you persecuting me? He asks a question, and then he gives a command. Get up, go to the city. Here's what we don't see from Saul. We don't see a bunch of excuses. We don't see anybody saying, it wasn't me. I was misled. I was confused. I thought I was doing the right thing. I was taught the wrong thing. He doesn't say any of that. What do, we, what do we see from Saul? We see obedience. We see obedience. Because he gets up and he goes. Because this event completely changed Saul's life. I want you to think about his position. He's heading down the road to Damascus with posse in tow, a warrant in his pocket, on a mission. He's the man. He is the authority figure. He went from that to being completely dependent on the people that were around him. Completely dependent. He was blind. He, he, he could have he walked right off the cliff if he, if he was left on his own. He went from being the authority figure to being completely dependent on others. Now, our testimonies may not include a road to Damascus moment, right? We may not have this powerful event. Mine, mine doesn't include the, the road to Damascus moment. But nobody's ever had a road to Damascus, Damascus moment like Saul's got. Nobody's got this conversion story like Saul. His conversion story was completely unique to him just like our conversion stories are completely unique to us. 
So if we start to make comparisons and say, well, I wish I had that or I wish I had this or I wish I'd have had the experience that Saul had, that's very dangerous. Because what you're saying, we didn't choose it. We didn't get to select it. We didn't have anything to do with it. What you're saying then is what God did wasn't good enough. The way God chose to save me wasn't good enough. That's very dangerous. That's like saying, I don't have this spiritual gift. I wish I had that. Saul's life changed immediately as a result of that event. He went to the authority figure, to the position of complete dependency. And when God called us, the same thing happened. We went from making ourselves the authority over everything. Like it or not, that's what we did before we were saved. We focused on our wants and our desires, our priorities, and doing everything in our own strength and became completely dependent on the Savior. So we've seen the, the before, we've seen Saul, we've seen the event, and now let's see the new creation in Paul. There was a disciple named, at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, I, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, the house of Judas. Look for a man of Tars, uh, Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias. Come in, lay his hands on him, that he may regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have been, I've heard many, I've, I've heard from many about this man. Much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. He has the authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said, Go, for he has cho the chosen instrument of mine to carry out my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my, the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, laying the hands on him. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road in which you came, has sent me so that you re may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit and immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight then he rose and was baptized taking food and he was strengthened for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying he is the son of God so who was Ananias Ananias uh, was a leader in the church in Damascus so he would have most likely had his name on one of those death warrants that Paul had his name would have been on the list and this guy gets a tough assignment you think you got a tough assignment he gets a tough assignment he says I want you to go and talk to this guy and help this guy that's been killing all your friends and brothers and sisters in Christ and having them locked up You see, Ananias questions God, but he doesn't run away. Like Jonah ran away, right? Jonah ran away. Ananias doesn't run away. He, he's asking legitimate questions. You've got to keep in mind here, Ananias had no way of knowing that Paul had been converted at this point. All he knew was he was coming. And the Lord gives very specific instructions to Ananias. Don't miss this. He tells him where to go, who to see when he gets there, what's going to be happening when he gets there, what the people will know and expect from him when he gets there. All those things, all those details are laid out for Ananias. He's even told that Saul's going to be praying when he gets there. This helps us understand what Saul's focus was. He'd been praying for three days. We don't know what his prayers were, but we do know that he had a desire to fellowship with the Father. As Christians, we should all have the desire to spend time in prayer and, and desire fellowship with the God that saved us. The Lord also explains that Saul's going to be a chosen instrument. He tells him, he tells him how he's going to be the chosen. So he's going to either be my chosen instrument. And he says, he's going to be my chosen instrument because he's going to carry the name of Jesus forward to all people groups. And we know that because we're referencing it tonight, right? 
He's going to be the chosen instrument. He's going to carry his name out to all the people's groups. So what does Ananias do? He gets up. He does what he's told. He does what he was instructed to do. He goes to Saul. He lays his hands on him, and he prays with him. And then we see Paul, the new creature, in verses 18 and 19. Immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes. He regained his sight, and he rose and he was baptized, taking food, and he was strengthened for some days. He was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He's the Son of God. So Paul immediately begins his life as a reborn Christian here, as a reborn uh, creature. He didn't wait for the perfect time in his life to decide to follow Christ. He didn't, he didn't decide to do anything. The time, the how, the place was completely out of his control. But we see his response here. He didn't look for an excuse to delay. He gets up. He gets baptized. And you've got to think about this. When he gets up and he gets baptized, he immediately puts himself in the same group that he had previously hated and was bound to kill and jail. He ad- immediately identified with that group and immediately disassociated himself from everything in his past. He went from here to here. Completely different. And what do we see him do? He immediately goes out to do what? Proclaim Jesus. There's no gray area in what he says here. He says Jesus is the Son of God. He doesn't say Jesus is great. Jesus is a great prophet or was a great prophet. Try Jesus. He was a good man. He doesn't say any of that stuff. Paul recognized Jesus as the Son of God. We can also see that he clearly understood that his position was in Christ because he was completely dependent on Christ. In 1 Timothy 1, 13 through 14, he says, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul was completely new in Christ. And all Christians have this recognition and realization of who we are and who God is. True Christians look back and can see the old self and the new self. Not perfect self. Not perfect, but transformed. So we started out tonight with a question. Can people change? And if so, how? So Paul's testimony, from Saul to Paul, is a powerful testimony that people can change. People can be transformed, but not on their own. So this, this message tonight has basically been to believers. And believers, we need to remember what God has saved us from. And meditate on how we either are or not serving the God that saved us. So like a good Berean, some of the questions we should be asking ourselves. Are we obedient like Ananias? Are we willing to trust in the Lord and take on tough assignments? Do our lives reflect that clear distinction between the old us and a new creation in Christ like we see in Paul? If not, what are we doing? What are we doing to progress our our sanctification process? Maybe you're listening tonight or watching this later on whatever video. Uh, I guess we don't have video anymore, but maybe you're watching this later and you're saying, "I, I have no idea what this transform life means I have no idea what this conversion is I have no idea what this is all about I can tell you it starts and ends with the gospel it starts and ends with Jesus Christ Jesus left heaven to come and live as a man and ultimately allowed himself to be nailed to a cross to become the perfect sacrifice for your sins 
through that sacrifice, he made a way for those who put their faith in him to have a relationship with God and become co-heirs with him. And later in his life in ministry, Paul describes the transformed life in this way, and I'll, I'll close it out with this. In 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21, he says, For the love of Christ controls us, because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, and those who might live no longer live for themselves, but for him who died, for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the time tonight. And I pray that we would see this example in Paul and would, it would remind us of your goodness towards us and all the things that you've done for us. Thank you for the ability to just look back and see what you've done, what you've saved us from, and look forward to the future with you uh, for eternity. And I pray that we would live our lives with a determination and a true commitment to serve you and honor you. And I pray that those that don't know you would reach out with a repentant heart and seek you. And I pray through all these things that you be glorified. In Christ's name, amen.